Okay, so we're going to continue. Um, uh, Dr. Park will uh, now join me um, up here. Uh, he's going to present on the political economy of military first politics under Kim Jong-il, um, a, a topic very close to my heart. Um, I, um, I think he has slides. Uh, so now Dr. Park will present for between 20 and 25 minutes. If he runs over time, uh, John will bang his shoe on the table again. Uh, and then we will uh, we will have our discussion and uh, and questions from the audience. Take it away, Dr. Park. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Park Hyung-jung. I work at Korean Institute for National Unific Unification. And my presentation is based on only my personal analysis. Okay. And my topic is North Korean uh, political economy of military first politics. I start with uh, conclusion. Yeah, the military uh, first politics uh, between 1995 uh, and uh, 2011 was a unique period in North Korean North Korean history, a most decentralized and most liberal period. The economy under the military first politics remained still the war making economy, taking advantage of increase in market transactions. And the necessity for mobilizing the bulk of resources for the military sector remained the highest purpose of managing the economy by the leader, albeit with different means and methods. Through weakened, uh, though weakened, the regime was powerful enough to be able to take care of directing, directing the economic activities and financial flows to support the military sector. In tune with this purpose, the leader distributed rent opportunities among regime agencies, collected loyalty donations from them, and made a, a revolutionary fund for investments in the regime's pivotal uh, projects. Uh, while the military sector was still under the control of the plans and principles, other parts of the economy were allowed or accepted to take advantage of commercial activi activities. In this regard, the tra uh, foreign trading companies operated by the regime agencies have played a pivotal role in the expansion of neo-patrimonial rent capitalism, rigged with corruption, bribery and extortion, and rent competition. The trading companies organized the vertical chains of entrepreneur, inter, entrepreneurial business for the production, collection, transport, and export of, of the primary goods, and thereby opened the protection from business opportunities for the semi-private entrepreneurs at the mid-low level hierarchy. hierarchy. The regime's internal security has taken care of any extravaganza from spontaneity and bottom-up in contradiction to war-making and protection. This is my conclusion, and I'll explain uh, what this means. And, uh, <clears throat> My presentation is uh, yes, rather more theoretical and conceptual, conceptual, and I cannot read all the things, and I cannot uh, uh, efficiently communicate with you. So you must uh, rapidly scan uh, each PPT. It's better, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, historical institutionalism. I have said that not uh, the the period uh, of military first politics was. A special period in North Korean history. And I can conceive North Korean history as, as a succession of several periods, several phases. And each phase is, uh, each in, in a phase, a path dependent, path dependent logic of positive feedback applies. A phase, a phase is made of sub, sub, sub phases of integration, consolidation, internal contradiction, critical juncture, and replacement. The phase of military first politics between 1995 and 2011 replaced the preceding one of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il coal reign between 1974 and 1995 and was superseded by the one, by the one of party-centered rule under Kim Jong-un from 2012. Kim Jong-un's rule is uh, structurally different from Kim Jong-il's rule. 
Kim Jong Un's party centered rule is different from military centered rule during the Kim Jong Il period. We must uh, differentiate. And uh, yes, the periods of 1989, 1995, and 2009, 2011 can be regarded as uh, intervening ones between phases or well, critical junctures. And outside in approach. Outside in approach means the geopolitical approach attach, attaches great importance to the international system as the shaper, shaper of states within it. North Korean state was, has been shaped by international relations or, uh, around North Korea. And don't forget, North Korea is though not a militarily weak, but a, a small power surrounded by a middle, South Korea, and great powers, the United States and China, in a restrictive security condition. Yes, it's very important, restrictive security and the, uh, condition. And it, North Korea must, in general, react and adjust itself externally, not only externally, but also internally to serious security challenges. If North Korea fails to reform, reorganize internal structure, uh, to be capable of uh, react to outside security challenges, North Korea have, would have disappeared. This is outside in. Yes, the most uh, important outside in condition is inter-Korean enduring rivalry. Yes, enduring rivalry. Uh, the the uh, most important characteristic of this uh, rivalry is that the impossibility of simultaneous security of the two Koreas. There are several reasons why uh, the simultaneous mutual security impossible in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula. There are several uh, problems. The desire to expansion and revisionism has been much stronger on the North Korean side because uh, North Korea is a small power and if current structure continues, as you see now, South Korea has risen, North Korea has declined. North Korea must, North Korea must, you know, to survive, crush this uh, current state, state, status quo in the Korean Peninsula. And the feeling of fear and the vulnerability has been much stronger on the North Korean side. Uh, please uh, take notice that uh, the desire to expansion and uh, feeling of fear and vulnerability, both are very, very strong in case of North Korea. Though the Iraq-US coalition has been status quo oriented and security seeking, it had to like aggressor to deter and balance the aggression of North Korea. Top down, outside in and top down. Outside in calls for top down because the internal, international relations could not determine the organization of internal uh, state. The protection and the regime supporters' privilege demands top down. The more the internal structure of inequality is rigid, extreme, politically determined, and defended at any cost, the greater the demand for top down coercive intervention from the top. Uh, the economy in North Korea has been structured and operated in such ways as to serve these two purposes. And market expansion did not nullify, nullify these two rules. And permanent prep, uh, preparation for war. Open its formation, its formation through revolution from outside by Soviet occupation and top down, also by Soviet occupation, North Korean state was more than fully mobilized for the impending war of aggression to the South in 1950. The three important, three, uh, important years between 48 to 50, North Korean state was mobilized. North Korean state and society was mobilized. And um, when uh, a war structure, war making structure is uh, uh, if it's fixed, then this war making structure will not uh, change or decrease after the war. 
The inter-Korean rivalry after the Korean War played the same role of war in its impact on the subsequent state development in North Korea. Uh, the North Korean state has been permanently in preparation for war in peacetime, and logically its economy it was uh, a permanent, permanently war-preparing, mobilizing economy. We should not uh, uh, forget this point. North Korean uh, economy has been a war economy, and also during the period of uh, military force politics. Extraction. Uh, North Korean state making can only be appropriately understood in this Tillian connection between war making, extraction, and state making. And you understand then the dominance of hardliner in North Korean history. The purge, does always the soft, soft liner was purged because it is structurally determined, we can say. And the advancement of a leader centric political system in order to mobilize more than your capability, a centric system should be uh, uh, constructed. A quasi totalitarian control of the society and indivi individual by state extremity in mobilization and ideology, the over, overblown party state bureaucratic structure. These abnormality or peculiarities could be explained by this uh, logic of uh, war making, state making, extra extraction. And protection of the Supporters' privilege. The Sangwon system, Sangwon principle applies not only to individuals, but also any party state unit in the, in the party state institutions. North Korean, uh, yes, we uh, live in the, you can say, um, horizontal society. Any individual, any organization are presumed to be the same rights. Uh, provided by the law, but in North Korea, the uh, over, uh, any unit is placed in a ladder of hierarchy, and there is a special unit of regime agencies. The party, the Ministry of, Uni uh, Ministry of People's Armed Forces, the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of Public Security, they are the core plus in the uh, regime among regime agencies, and they are provided with special rights. The economic kingdom of uh, special units. Major regime agencies have their own group of enterprises and economic businesses. They were given permission to be organized under the three pretexts of self support and self financing for the regime's monumental projects and revenue creation for loyalty donation to the leader. The conglomerate, conglomerate, conglomerate of each special unit made itself an independent kingdom. These are co-class, we, in, in, yes, we, in comparison to individual sangun. And military force politics. The military force politics was inaugurated and carried out under, under simultaneous advance of three, as for North Korea, extraordinary con uh, conditions. First, external tension reduction under the, con under the condition of most disadvantageous relative power relations. Second, the weakening of the relative power of the leader and the center toward the elites and periphery. Third, the regime's grip on the population has been the weakest in this period in the historic of, history of North Korea. Only on the, we, when, only when we consider these three conditions, we can understand, we can understand what has happening during this period. And the state, uh, state defense commission controlled by the read leader rose in its prestige, allotment of power and wealth opportun opportunities above other regime agencies, such as the central party, the military of the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of of public security and the cabinet. The purpose was to implement the principle of priority resource provision to the military and defense 
research. This was the uh, meaning of the military, uh, the economic policy of the during the military force politics. This is the highest purpose when Kim Jong Il managed the economy during this period. This was the highest purpose. And uh, uh, the market in uh, military force politics was hierarchically structured. It, it was a four tier economy on the top, Kim Jong Il. The, uh, on the second tier, tra trading companies. On the third tier, middle level local business offices and uh, private entrepreneurs. And the fourth tier, the producers. There is a very important Kim Jong Il's role to preside over the whole politically dominated, dominated business-like system and to assure its direction, direction to let for regime pro, uh, preservation, to distribute business licenses or rent earning opportunities and to manage rent competition among <laughs> regime agencies. Um, Yes, the trading companies affiliated to regime agencies competed among themselves to obtain monopoly trade licenses from Kim Jong-il and concomitant political cover and protection from him and for snatching export goods, production businesses from other companies there under different regime agencies. There are very strong uh, competition among regime agencies to get more uh, rent opportunities and uh, from uh, Kim Jong Il and to uh, snatch other agencies' uh, businesses. And they are obliged to, yes, and the local business offices and producers. Uh, the backbone of the trading companies were the middle level offices and semi private merchants. Uh, they were an amalgamation of official protection and private capital and commercial talent. The private local business were given official status, such as the local office of the central trading companies, and their private managers were given job titles of administrative or military ranks, depending upon the size of the business and the uh, higher, now, which is uh, on the higher mother, organi mother organization. The local business company is uh, actually privately owned and pri privately managed, but they were given official status by the uh, higher organization. And neo patrimonial capital, rent capitalism. The leader managed the rent opportunities are uh, semi privately. The major regime agencies were allotted monopolies and licenses for rents, which were to be realized through politically structured market mechanisms. And the party state units and officials were quasi bestowed with quasi licenses for graft. Yes, uh, ubiquitous uh, corruption is an extortion mechanism and uh, is a mechanism for uh redistribute surpluses so that this distribution of surpluses could be in tune with political hierarchies in a corrupt system if we are on the top of the system then you get more revenues and you are on in the on the bottom then you must pay always pay so corruption is a mechanism of redistribute economic surpluses to the um, yes to the political hierarchy. Yeah, the priority of political connection over productivity. Uh, the market is in this neo patrimonial capitalism was a political political market dominated by rent seeking pursuits. In this market, not productivity but political connection. Determined, determined who and which group owns money. The regime has been able to manipulate the market expansion, its structure and contents, and the level of its maturation.
yes, we arrived again. Conclusion. Perfect time. Thank you. Perfect time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Park. Perfect timing, of course, um, and fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, Professor Gray, uh, who is en route, will uh, now uh, act as discussant. Professor Gray will have 10 minutes, uh, then we will have 15, 14 minutes for the audience, and then we will go off and get caffeinated. Professor Gray, your 10 minutes start now. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Park, for that uh, re really interesting paper. Now, I do, uh, of, of course, I've read the paper and I, and I, and um, just to be clear, um, you are quite upfront that it's a work in progress still. Um, so uh, my comments uh, won't be too harsh. And I think what I'll do is just try to give you a few indicators where I think you might sort of like to develop the paper or improve the paper so it's in that in that spirit um i mean i should just say first of all i think it's a it's an ambitious paper uh, extremely ambitious actually i think and um because i mean my summary of it is you're using historical institutionalism you're using neo-realist international relations theory and you're also using this kind of neo Weberian charles tillian war making and state making kind of argument and uh, that's that's a lot in itself and and then you're also explaining the history of north korean state formation and the um the nature of the political economy under the kim jong il era which i think all those things together maybe feel that, i mean that's really ambitious that's probably uh, for my liking it's perhaps a bit maybe you're trying to do too much in one paper and this could be actually be maybe two separate papers, I think, and that might sort of um, sort of uh, make it a little bit easier to digest in one go. So that's that's just a, a general uh, uh, suggestion. I mean, for me, I think, um, you know, I was trying to sort of think, well, what is what is the main argument here? Um, what you know, what, what what should I take away from this paper? For me, what I found most interesting, I think, was the the application of Charles Tilly's sort of uh, um, War, war making state state formation argument to the Kim Jong Il era. That, I mean that, that 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 was good. And you're doing something very distinctive. I mean I like the way that you do separate the North Korean economy into sort of three different sectors: uh, the military security sector, which performs the function of war making and, 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 and state making, and then you say there's a there's the dictator and his supporter sector, which performs the function of protection. You know, using Tilly's concepts, and then there's the production sector. But I wonder if that that separation of sectors in those way that that way that is a bit a little bit too simple. And and I wonder if Charles Tilly himself would sort of accept. That you could you could sort of apportion these different sort of functions of of the state to these different sectors because I think uh, you know one of the important things is the sort of mutual dependencies between different sectors. So um, you, you know, for example, you say the production sector is about extraction, okay, but that's also very much a part of the war making um, kind of function. So I, I did sort of. Um, I guess I was a little bit skeptical about about this kind of separation of, of compartmentalizing of the North Korean economy in those in, the, in in that way. But you know that maybe that's that's that maybe that's um, maybe I'm wrong. I mean that's that maybe that's an interesting distinctive um, feature of um, the North Korean political economy. But then I was thinking, well, could you do that with other states, with the United States? Could you take the military industrial complex, for example, and say, mm -hmm. well, that's that's the that's the um, the war making part of the state, and then divide it? So, but I'll come back in a moment to what I think is um, interesting about or, or what you could draw out of the North Korean case that actually could speak back to the theories that you're using. So there's that. So there's that. Um, I think I, in the paper, I would have found it a lot um, more but, but easier to digest if you had been a bit more clear about um, what the state of the literature is on the um, the Kim Jong-il political economy era, okay, the, the existing research, and then what you find to be problematic. You did have one sentence in your paper where you say that... Um, the North Korean economy has been analyzed as a relatively independent and autonomous entity from a pure economic perspective. But 
I, I was quite surprised to read that because I, 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 I'm, I mean, most works that look at the sort of the North Korean economy, I mean, by the nature of its economy, you have to think about political economy, right? So I, I wasn't quite sure where that, that pure economic perspective was. And uh, and it's it's uh, and again, I mean, of course, a lot of works on political economy use a perspective of methodological nationalism and take the nation state mainly as the container. But when we look at North Korea, of course, we have to think about other other things, the role of foreign aid in the 1950s, uh, the, the, the impact of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, the 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 impact of the rise of China. So again, I I wasn't I felt that that your your statement there was perhaps not entirely fair to the existing research on this era. So I I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, uh, what you see as being the shortcomings of the existing literature on the North Korean economy, and then how you're contributing to that. And I, I also um, I mean the paper itself is I mean it's kind of two thirds theory i think you have a really huge theoretical section now that that imbalance may be because as you said it's a bit incomplete it's, but it means uh, you know i can't not talk about the theoretical um contribution but i but i but i um i think there was a more general question that it it gave rise to in my mind in the sense that um i mean historiography is something else but if you look at social science studies of, of north korea it usually takes the form of, you know, we are sort of North Korean specialists and we're interested in the empirics of what is happening in North Korea. So, but then we go and we find some sort of Western social theory that we can use to shed light. I mean, I think your paper was the same and you use that to shed light on the North Korean case. But I think there's another step there that you can take is that what can you then take back from North Korea and, and, and to come back to the theory and, and then maybe change our, our sort of theoretical uh, expectations. And I was just thinking, so for example, in your paper, you use a sort of neo-realist um, you know, a sort of Mearsheimer kind of, uh, you know, strategic dilemma kind of framework to explain inter-Korean relations. Now, that theory is based on um, sort of uh, the, the, the European North American experience, right? And it's uh, neorealism is understood to be this sort of timeless logic that dates back to the time of Thucydides and this kind of thing. But when you look at inter-Korean relations, it's it's something quite I think it's something else. It's it's it is two states formally, but it's also two divided parts of a single nation. And so you might look at it from a say, I'm I'm, I'm not a constructivist, but you might look at it and and say, well, this actually shows quite different sort of dynamics because, say for example, South Koreans, they do look as not at North Korea as an enemy state, but they also look at it as a kind of um a kind of uh, problematic long lost brother as well right you know uh, i mean it depends where you are on the political spectrum in south korea so mm -hmm. i think in some sense when we look at the case of korea it also can sort of problematize these kind of um uh, these grand theories that are, that are derived in a completely different context to, to describe something quite else so I, I i was a bit sort of um uh uh, uh sort of yeah, I was interested in, in, in that, about what the case of North Korea or Korea can tell us about those original theories. Um, so, I, I mean, I have to say, you know, just by way of explanation, you didn't focus on, on, on that part in your presentation. So, but but I'm sort of speaking to the paper here, just, just by way of explanation. Now, to get on to the, um, the, the, the details of your empirical uh, sort of case study about military first politics, um, I mean, you did it a little bit in your presentation, but I, I was just kind of, um, I, I was a bit unsure what exactly your definition of military first politics is, because that in, in itself is contested. You can look at it as, you know, in, in line with North Korean discourse that um, it was about the increased influence of, of the military in the 1990s and it actually played, you know, its prestige got greater. Or it could be much more kind of window dressing as a way to keep the military on the side, but it was still basically a, a, um, a, a sort of Leninist party state, or it, it remained so. But um, I wasn't. What I guess what confused me is that um, 
a lot of the feet, I mean, I really like your explanation of, um, I forget your term, what was it, neo-patrimonial capitalism. I, I thought that was a really great way of sort of capturing the nature of the North Korean political economy. But um, that, uh, it came into existence after the collapse of the economy in the early 1990s. But isn't it the case that that's kind of continued now? But we've kind of moved on from military first politics in a way, because when Kim Jong-un came to power, there was, a, you know, people talked about a return to the party, right? The party as being the um, the, the the sort of lead, leading institution. And, and now you hear about the sort of um, the NEGAC, the, the um, um, cabinet as being the kind of economic headquarters. But your explanation based on this kind of state building, war building, it doesn't really explain the specificity of that particular era uh, from, 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 from my understanding, because um, that the nature of the kind of political economy has, uh, I think that means I need to stop, yep. right? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, that, that's, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's, that's kind of what I was interested in is, is then how do you, okay, what, then what happened after the military first politics era, right? Because many of those features of the political economy still seem to be broadly similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's some of that. And then the last thing, um, I, I just wanted to know a little bit about the, what do you think the policy implications are of your uh, analysis of North Korea. You know, there's always this debate about, um, uh, you know, you might come up with a peace agreement and then suddenly North Korea become a, you know, drop all its guns and become a peace loving nation and things like that, right? Which um, I guess in terms of the sort of Tillian kind of um, war making, state making, I mean, you could make a case for that. Um, but nonetheless, you're also using different theoretical resources like neorealism, which would suggest that, you know, there's this strategic dilemma and we need to um, kind of, uh, uh, sort of balance against North Korea and this kind of thing. So, yeah, maybe you could just speak a bit about the um, the, the policy implications. But I, I'll stop there. I have loads more questions, but um, I think for uh, the sake of everyone's patience and uh, time and everything, I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much for excellent uh, discussion. And um, uh, Professor Gray excellently uh, summarized the problems which I plan to solve. Yes, it's an excellent summary of what I think I should research in the future. But uh, I, I have not yet uh, all the answers and I still uh, searching for theories and uh, re uh, empirical uh, realities, how to formulate my thesis. And uh, it was, um, not easy for all the theories uh, combined to analyze, to mobilize, to analyze North Korea. Yes, but uh, yes, you have excellently summarized my problems. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, so the floor is, is yours. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Park? John. About halfway through your presentation, when you were talking about the three factors of the military first policy, you suggest that under, in that period, that the regime's, I think you used the word grip or control of the population was weaker than at any other time. I, I wondered about that point. I mean, do you think that the regime's grip was weaker then than it is now, for example? Um. Yes, I, I, uh, I've said that uh, military first politics, the period of military first politics is a special period in North Korea. And I named, uh, I mentioned three uh, conditions. That's right. And uh, the uh, Kim Jong-un, the regime, Kim Jong-un regime has been, was strengthened because of the success of the military first politics. And during the military first politics, North Korea uh, gained more stability, internal stability, and North Korea had uh, by time to develop uh, missile and uh, nuclear technologies. And so Kim Jong-un could uh, take on offensive against the United States and against the South Korea. The offensive has started in 2009. And uh, one of the offense, the, one of the fronts of, of offensive is uh, internal enemies, internal enemies, to, to reverse back the power relations between the regime and the population. And uh, the meaning of uh, party 
party-based politics uh, under Kim Jong-un is to reverse the, the, uh, the weakened power relations between regime and uh, population. And I suppose he has succeed, succeeded. Kim Jong-un has succeeded. And Kim, uh, upon inauguration of uh, periodic succession in, in 2009, under Kim Jong-un's direction, North Korea began to construct border wall, barbed wire border wall uh, between uh, China and North Korea. And now there is no, yes, virtually no defectors from North Korea. Yeah, especially uh, the COVID-19 has intervened. Uh, but the border wall construction, barbed wire border wall construction has completed recently in 2011 and 12. And uh, yes, one of the most important uh, regime's internal policy is, is to strengthen party grip on the population. Okay, um, any more questions? Oh, please. As I understand it, often based on the depictions of models, you're focusing entirely on the country itself rather than the geosphere. And I was wondering if we could possibly seek to employ something from geosphere to understand North Korea. Uh, and it seems to me that a lot of the countries that we're focusing on, their most obvious aim in the geosphere is to retain their current status. And given that's a kind of war footing, it seems to me not entirely possible for us to have a kind of institutional analysis that focuses purely on the kind of internal apparatus. I would have thought it would be much more instructive for us to examine the kind of permutations in play that come from the geosphere. <laughs> Um, in, by geosphere, you mean the regional context, or sorry? Oh, I, I guess penetrating the political system. You know, I mean, it seems to me that if you're going to be looking at the kind of internal dynamics of North Korea or the Soviet Union mm -hmm. or any of those other kind of authoritarian states, and we're using these kind of capitalist molding structures to analyze them, whether it's state markets or whatever the case may be equally dynamic in terms of defining their, their internal self-images and self, um, I don't know, perpetuation would be the impact of, you know, the power elite surrounding it. And I, I would have thought that we need to be examining that as much as we should be depicting the models. Okay, yeah. Um, that's a comment, right? So, um... well, Fair enough. Comment about the kind of analysis. Sure. sure. Uh, any more questions? Go on, Owen. My question seems, it feels like a slightly trivial question, but it's something that raised in my mind in some, what some things you were saying about the intense nature of the rent competition between the special units under presumably the military or the uh, Ministry of Public Security or so on. It raised in my mind, do we have evidence that there have been violent confrontations within North Korea over these uh, these kind of licenses or whatever to to, uh, to to take rent? I mean, we're talking about the specific parts, the specific parts of the state which are engaged in these most lucrative activities are also the most well armed and most well trained in violence. Was there violence, or do we have any evidence of such violence, or was it all completely suppressed because they are all under the uh, leader? Yes, um, the, the, the leader's grip on uh, special units was uh, weakened, uh, has been weakened during the military force politics. And Kim, one of the Kim Jong Un's purpose is to strengthen his grip on uh, on special units, the regime agencies. And Kim Jong Un made a great purge, and uh, demolished the power of the military, political power of the military, 
and he purged uh, Chang Song Tech, and he reorganized the uh, elite groups, what the, the, the relations between among regime agencies, the hierarchy of the regime agencies, usually the party, the parties on the top of the regime hierarchy. But during the military first politics, the military was uh, on the top uh, hierarchy. Mm. And uh, Chang Song Tech was purged because of this rent competition. Chang Song Tech occupied a, a, a very lucrative sea farm. And uh, it is said that uh, the, the lock, uh, rocket unit would like to take this uh, sea farm from uh, Chang Song Tech. And the rocket unit uh, talked to Kim Jong un, and Kim Jong un arrived. Okay, you can take uh, this sea farm from Chang Song Tech. And Chang Song Tech uh, rejected. And uh, Chang Song Tech was charged with, we can say, treason. So, in a sense, the conflicts are always mediated by the leader yeah, yes. rather than a direct. And, yeah, I can. Uh, Yes, show you other cases, more than yeah, this case. It's like mergers and acquisitions, North Korean style, have to go through the leader. You have to send up documents, you know, your verified, uh, your, uh, what's it called, your ratified uh, decision from the leader is what determines uh, who controls the unit. Any more questions? Yeah, and too. Um, Please. In, in some ways, it also relates to, to the paper that you and Dr. Lenkov gave, which is about state capacity within the context of what, you know, in global history is identified as a neoliberal period. Um, and, uh, you know, the story of neoliberalism is one, there's many versions of it, right? Sometimes it's a story of kind of ideological emergence, and um, sometimes it's a story of just IMF intervention. But th there's also stories that focus on state capacity through new modes of technological intervention with the everyday. And so I'm actually, um, I, I really enjoyed this talk and I really enjoyed sort of a non-Kim-centric story of, of how the North Korean state is operating. But one of the things I wonder about is just how new modes of sort of technological interfacing with the public is changing how the state is operating over the course of these past couple of decades. Is that clear? I'm, I'm not sure maybe that's too ambiguous. Um, so the technical basis of state capacity and how it's evolved over time. You know that smartphone? Smartphone? Well, yeah, smart certainly. Phone. So, so what was the smartphone I was talking yeah, about? Yeah, along the way, I'll put you this way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah um, between the United States and uh, Soviet Union, they uh, compete uh, with uh, ideology. They, uh, they carry out ideological competition. And uh, they compete uh, also positional competition in the, in the, in the inter international relations. But they are apart between great uh, seas. And they are totally different countries. <laughs> they have two countries as a different history, and uh, ethnicity is very different. But in South Korea, in, in the two Korean case, they are contiguous, and they are in the uh, ideological systemic com competition. They are positional competition, and they are uh, they are compete with subvert sub subversion. Subversion is very very effective, efficient in the two Korean cases. And the uh, new technology, yes, increased the, the capability of subversion. May, it may not be consciously uh, uh, carried out by South Korea, but uh, North Korea, because of this uh, technological development of subversion, it feels more fear, more vulnerable, <laughs> And now they close any contact with South Korea and, and also any contact with other countries. 
I think with respect to state capacity in North Korea, the resource shock of the late 1980s and early 1990s is really, really important, right? So when we talk about uh, the collapse of trade with the Soviet Union, and I mean, the South Korean scholars have talked about this, I really actually like it. The idea that North Korea was once upon a time, uh, it directed its rent seeking outside, and it re in the form of aid. So it was a, it, the first rental regime was just basically acquiring free stuff from the socialist bloc or at subsidized prices, and then, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, engaging in barter with the socialist world at very subsidized rates that were very preferential to the Kim family, as it were, Kim family regime. And then uh, you have this transition to the 1990s where um, rent seeking is primarily directed inwards because there's, yeah, which I find rather interesting. Um, but with respect to technical capacity, I think it's actually a very important point, but I think we should take a more expansive view of technology to not only include phones and physical technology but also ideas i know i understand you you understand this better than i do but anyways but ideas so the um the the north koreans have um shall we say uh rather um sketchy understanding of how reforms might work i think um from reading their literature and reading what they say internally as well um and their idea about how to regulate the market i would say is quite primitive as well um and even, you know, as I've looked at their tax system and how it deals with foreigners, and it does, it is a bit more sophisticated than their internal tax system for how they deal with markets, but it is still pretty primitive. They seem to lack some of the fundamental modern technologies of state capacity, modern state technologies, as it were. And technologies in an expansive sense, techniques, ideas, etc. cetera. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to add. Um, sorry, I, it's, this is not my time. That's why I'm talking quickly. Um, any more questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Caffeine time. <laughs>